Um, so, we'll get things started. Uh, first off, if you were here last year, we had Ludwig Göransson talking a little bit about Black Panther before it came out. Ooh. The movie became the most successful Marvel movie in history. <laughs> he went on, on a separate note, because he, he co-writes and produces from Childish Gambino to win a Grammy oh. as well. who was on our panel last year, just received an Emmy nomination. So, of course, if they had not done this panel, none of that would have happened. <laughs> so. I didn't do the panel last year. <laughs> oh. Did you get nominated this year? No. <laughs> so. But this is the anniversary of you being nominated for Pan Am. Today, you were nominated for that, Pan Am. That means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. So, 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 everyone here has been on the panel in a different capacity before, with the exception of Mr. Kirk Farquhar. So, I'm a newbie. And Chris Beck is on his way. He's promised me he's on his way. He was in Carlsbad 30 minutes ago, so we'll see how long that's so he's traveling like an ant because he's in. So <laughs> um, and what else we're going to start with? Um, so first off, we will start by talking about the Kurt Farquhar. Kurt, um, you're new to the whole superhero experience. Yes, I am. Uh, your background is you you studied at Berkeley. You also studied in Versailles. Yes. And you, you studied with some jazz masters as well? Yeah, I uh, studied with uh, Johnny Leland, and then I moved out to Los Angeles and I started touring with uh, Freddie Hubbard when I was like 20 years old. <clears throat> and I played with Art Farmer, Joe Henderson, and Herbie Hancock and some guys. And then how do you go from that to entering the superhero genre? <laughs> well, uh, how I got into television is old fashioned way. Uh, uh, I had been homeless and uh, living on the streets, and my brother was uh, telling me, you need to get, you, you should be trying to do television. You know, you write so many things, and I don't see why you're uh, going the, the way you're going. And uh, uh, I tried it one time. It worked out for me. I uh, tried it again, and it kept going. I wondered, what would it be like to, if I actually applied myself? So, uh, <laughs> And three years later, I picked up a uh, nine TV series, and uh, I've been running multiple series for the last 30 years. Ever since then. And Black Lightning is produced by Greg Berlanti, and, and, and Greg Berlanti seems like he's always used the same composer over and over again for every one of his projects. He's got like nine TV shows in addition to Black Lightning on the air now. Um, I let one get by. <laughs> one goes by and you're sitting on the panel with me. <laughs> I don't know how I got here. <laughs> well, first off, we're going to start with a, a clip from Black Lightning. So you want to set that up? Or? Uh, well, uh, there's going to be a, a lot of black people in... in <laughs> Electricity out of the thing. Other than that, I hope it sounds good. <laughs> um, Mara had a conversation with him earlier <clears throat> when we started the, the show. I've been working with them for uh, about 20 years. Uh, we've done shows from Girlfriends and The Game and uh, uh, Being Mary Jane. And uh, so there's a long relationship there, but I have never done uh, anything like this for them. So I, my hat's off to them for taking the chance on me and uh, helping me steal at least one away from Blake. <laughs> I promise it's over with from here. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, they had a lot 
lot of conversations about you wanted you wanted some uh, interesting sounds, and uh, uh, they wanted to do a few things that that uh, made made you aware that it was an African American cast. I mean, there's a lot of it we do in subtle ways. I mean, I didn't want to put a beat on uh, everything, you know, but uh, in terms of like this, instead of doing it in a traditional way and going straight hip hop, there's actually in the rock. Uh, edgy portion of that key where the girls are fighting. There's actually uh, a trap, hip, a trap hip hop beat underneath that. You know, uh, I do things. Uh, I, I wish we'd uh, play the scene with the strings, but a lot of times, I I will uh, break up uh, strings like a hip hop beat. Instead of doing a hip hop beat, I'll have the the lower basses do it, uh, being a kick drum and a, and a, a violins doing the fast hi hat piece and some violas being a, uh, a snare. And it's different. You say, mm, there's something that's interesting and that's drawing me that I, that I connect to in a way, but it's, 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 it feels kind of like urban, but it's not really. We're not using urban sounds a lot of times. So rhythmically, I try to uh, uh, do something that makes you, makes you feel, well, this is not only happening, but it's happening to these particular people. Okay. All right, I also want to talk about how struggles um, someone had also in terms of coming into this business um, from an area not really known for composers and a person came from the rough streets of Paris, Texas, <laughs> Mr. Blake Neely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to show, explain the clip we're going to show on, on yours. So this is a clip from, the, we did a four part crossover this year with all the shows called Crisis on Earth X. You might saw it this year. And this is, this is just a, one of my favorite things to do each, each year is to do a mashup of all their themes. So this is a big suit up clip. So we don't usually have live musicians on the superhero shows, but it was a four, it was a two night, four part, huge thing. And I'm like, we have to have orchestra for this. It's gonna be massive. So we did get an orchestra for this one, which was a lot of fun, just to make it even harder to get done in a week. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, La La Land Records released the special, the special four part score album. And that's in the goodie bags if you ask good questions. <laughs> and also, if you purchase it, um, it goes to a special. Can we talk about that? Yeah. There's a. If, if people purchase the album. So the so one of my friends, Mike Gerhardt, who started La La Land, um, right like the week before we um, were doing this Crisis on Earth X, he lost his home in a in the massive fires in California, the Thomas fires. So we um, Warner Brothers agreed to give all proceeds from this soundtrack to the United Way Fund that benefits Thomas Fire's victims, so. Right. I'm gonna mark guys on the next one, but before I do that, last year someone said, there's no women composers on the panel. Well, uh, I, we did, I did a panel a couple of months ago with Pinar Toprock. In fact, if you look at the program, she was listed for Krypton, and she also did additional music for Justice League. And because of that panel, what do you know? She is now the composer of Captain Marvel. She can't do anything but write music right now for that. So, you know, we hope to have her here next year. She's in the car with Chris. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mark Aisha, Cloak and Dagger. First off, again, congratulations for after seven years. Once upon a time, I'm nominated. So, tell us about Cloak and Dagger and your musical audience for this. Well, Joel Pokeski, the showrunner for Cloak and Dagger, really wanted to take a, a, a different approach uh, uh, with the whole show, but specifically musically. It's obviously a story of two teenage superheroes, but they have no idea that they're superheroes. Um, and I think, I think we're up to episode seven now has been released, so I can't tell you where we end up by episode ten. But the, suffice it to say that they're basically spending a lot of episodes just trying to figure out what the hell has happened and what, what actually powers they do have. It becomes more of an allegory for just teenage angst and discovering yourself as a human being 
as well. So he asked that the music really take much more of a, how should I say it, an emotional uh, <coughs> bent, a very atmospheric bent, because he as well has made the show quite surreal when there are these, these states that people go into where their fantasies are revealed and their dreams are revealed and um, both Tyrone and, and Handy have this ability to sort of see into people's subconscious and so you have these the score has a very very different texture than what you would think a, a superhero show would have okay but let's show cloak and dagger although this is a bit of an action sequence <laughs> Jonathan Christensen, who's the music supervisor, and again, unlike at least a lot of the um, more action-y shows that I'm familiar with, there's a great reliance on songs on this, just to keep the, the teenage world very alive uh, in the show. And so we're constantly doing things where this, the score goes up to the song, the song gets interspersed with the score, and things like that. Is this the same time frame you're working with Cloak and Dagger as you work with Once Upon a Time in terms of delivering shows? Uh, we have a little more time, but it's you know seven to ten days per, per episode. Okay. Whereas Once Upon a Time used to be strict seven days. And Mr. Tyler Bates. Before we get to your clip, we're gonna. What is my clip? <laughs> I think it's Guardians 2. We did Guardians 1. You also did Deadpool 2 this year. So, <laughs> so I, I think the clip that you sent us was from. I got through it. <laughs> like he came back. And, and yes. You know, I, know, it. So I think the clip you, you that was sent is Guardians 2. That's a mystery to me, too. Okay. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Something that's very characteristic of the score for the Guardians movies is uh, that there's a very tuneful score that I would say is about 50 or 60 percent of the music in the film. Sometimes I'm known as, you know, whatever, dark or noisy or discordant, but in the context of Guardians, you know, James Gunn has uh, really enlisted me to write tuneful melodies that are thematically uh, restated throughout the film in different, you know, dynamic and emotional instantiations. So that is a theme that we call father-son, and um, he shot to that particular, like a demo of that piece. And that's pretty, pretty cool to actually be able to write music uh, to the script and um, during production and have the actors, the cinematographer, and really all the crew members listen to the music and earbuds while they're filming and uh, performing and then they digitally remove the earbuds afterwards. So it's, uh, it's great to be able to, in, you know, sort of integrate the musical language of what the score is uh, into a film, especially in this day when, uh, when things are moving so quickly and they're oftentimes inspired by music not written for the film, so. So when you worked on the first one, did that, this kind of method come in at all, or was this because you had a relationship? Yeah, and, and James and I have done four features together, and I think about ten PG porn shorts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, yeah, after we did Super, actually during Super, I, I wrote a piece of music for him to film the end of the music, movie to, and he really enjoyed it. So that was our game plan going into Guardians 1, and I wrote several pieces of music that, uh, strangely enough, remain pretty similar in structure uh, to the demo. So that was cool. Now, Chris Beck magically has made it in. Woo! So we're going to show a clip from Ant Man. This is from the first Ant Man. So you could, um, can you explain? We tried to get a clip from the second Ant Man, but. Uh, it only came out a few weeks ago, so. Yes, we you know how Marvel is. Marvel is uh, like giving us anything. They said everything's a spoiler. So, um, for, first of all, I just want to apologize to you guys and Ray and to all of you guys for being late. I have no excuse. Um, this clip is from the first Ant Man, and it's uh, uh, during a scene where he's. Uh, uh, it's the beginning of, uh, of the big third act heist, and. He's basically surfing on a whole pile of ants through the sewers, and this was 
uh, a piece of music that um, I literally was half finished with and just had come up with an idea for it, something I struggled with for weeks, months even, um, and finally this idea came so late that I had to get on the plane to London to go record it before I was finished, and it was kind of finished by my crew long distance uh, with me in my hotel the night before. So it's one of those crazy last minute situations. So musically, you, you, you did like a, a seven beat? Yeah, um, I wanted to do something quirky and offbeat for the character of Ant-Man, um, and while still um, making sure that it felt like it wasn't completely outside the Marvel Universe. Um, so I kind of settled on a, a kind of heisty feel in 7-8. Um, that refers to most, most pop music and, and contemporary music is four or sometimes three beats to a bar. Um, but when you go into what are called odd meters, where you get into seven beats to the bar or five, um, it starts to feel like there is maybe an extra beat in every bar or a beat missing in every bar, and it gives it a real kind of quirky feel. Um, I, I continue that tradition for Ant-Man and the Wasp. The Wasp theme is in five, um, and it really gives a sense of, uh, I think, a sense of uh, forward momentum and, and great energy. And you've worked with Peyton, the director, for almost 20 years. On, this, on the first superhero movie, Bring It On. With <laughs> <laughs> I saw that in the theater. <laughs> uh, there weren't too many odd meters in that one. <laughs> All right, I'm going to open it up to questions, and then if I can have somebody help me give goodie bags to the people who ask the questions. So line up. We'll start with this gentleman right here. Hi. I was going to ask um, if there was a particular score or work uh, when you were younger that made you think, oh, I want to do that. I want to write that kind of music. Star Wars. <laughs> Absolutely Star Wars. Everything Blake Neely does. <laughs> because I'm that much older than you. <laughs> For the most part, I'm doing it. So, yeah, things that I'd love to do. I'm just uh, for the whole panel wondering, have you ever worked with directors who are also musicians themselves, and how does that collaboration work? Is the editing more inclined to be set to music, and how does that relationship work? Uh, I did a movie with Mike Figgis. I think I was the last composer that Mike was made to hire. After that, he got good enough as a composer that he scored all his film sets by himself. And it is sort of interesting to have a director turn to you and say, shouldn't that E natural be an E flat? And, you know, can be very specific in his notes. <laughs> but the good news was that Mike's a really good musician and his notes were actually pretty good. Uh, I worked for a gentleman by the name of uh, Jeff Schechter, who was a musician as well. Uh, the, one of the, he was a, a classical oboe player, so he really pushed for more orchestral sounds. Uh, but the show he was doing had a lot of, of, of electronic and weird and quirky sounds because it was a, a show about uh, hacking into the brains of recently dead people. So, <laughs> you know, he wanted something a little bit more weird, a little bit strange, but kept pushing me to uh, put more orchestral sounds in there. And he was, the, the good part about it is he really, really, really liked music. I mean, there was a music, a wonderful music supervisor on the show, uh, Heather Greenberg, and, uh, she, and she did a lot of really cool songs. But he was, uh, whenever it came up between a battle between them, should this be played with the song or should be played with the, uh, with the score, uh, he tended to lean towards the score because he just loved that sound uh, uh, much more. I've worked with directors who think they're good musicians. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> Next. Hey, good morning. Uh, curious if you've ever written something that was rejected, but you later were able to find a way to sneak it in, and you're like, take that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> That's like, you just described every Tuesday of my life. <laughs> I'll take the fifth, you can skip over. 
It is funny though that when you write something that's rejected, we're, we're so tied to the visual that it's really hard to use a certain piece of music for a different visual or even a different character, um, especially for a different project because music really time stamps itself on what you were doing. I mean, you remember when you heard a song when you were dating when you were 16? And for us, like, I remember, I wrote that for that scene, for that character, and it's hard to, but I do it. I still use it, I use everything. <laughs> but it's just difficult. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with uh, Blake on that, that, you know, when, when you're, it's such a personal thing when you're looking at that picture and you're seeing every, every little nod of the head, every blink of the eye, every little inflection what the actors are doing. I mean, I have a concept I call dancing with dialogue and where if I'm doing it right, it's like an embrace and I'm wrapped around them and I'm not pulling against them, you know, it's not pulling in different ways. And so it's hard to just place something on, on, on the scene uh, as opposed to having it envelop itself and, 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 and draw its strength from what's happening on the picture. It's nice to, if you do draft seven, eight versions of a cube, yeah. as per requested, uh, <laughs> to be in a larger room eventually and have uh, a request made and then, you know, go back to version one, <laughs> um, which happens frequently. But my sanity is in writing songs and producing songs now, so that seems to balance up perhaps any frustrations I have with the... Uh, with the Q writing process. This actually just happened to me on uh, Ant Man and the Wasp. I had been messing around at home on my piano with a version of the Ant Man theme that was pretty dark, uh, but that the more I just messed around with it, the more I fell in love with it. So I, I put a version together and played it for the guys, and I kind of prefaced it by saying, you know, there's no place for this in the movie. This is a, a fun movie, and this movie, this version of this theme is really kind of extendedly dark. Um, so just put it in our back pocket and then I thought, okay, well maybe we could sneak it in at the end credits. At the very last minute, that's what we did. Um, those of you who've seen Ant-Man on the Boss, when you've seen the mid credit scene, without going into spoilers, you know, that's probably the darkest part of the whole movie. And that's where we decided to place it right after that scene. And uh, you know, when I saw it, uh, the first time I really saw it, I I didn't really see the end credit scene until the very last moment, and I didn't even realize where they had placed that piece until the premiere, and uh, I was really pleasantly surprised at the effect it created. It was really kind of chilling after what we saw in the mid credit scene. I, I had an experience once where uh, I was doing a scene, and the character kept referring to Beethoven. You know, listen, you got to listen to Beethoven. You got to listen to Beethoven, and so I kept. I, I heard the picture editor say, well, maybe we should, you know, license the page of it. And so in an attempt to put that away and so that it would never happen, I said, well, I'm going to just take an afternoon, a couple of hours, and write a version of some Beethoven, put it in there, just show them how terrible it is, and then we can dispense with the entire idea. So I did it, I played it, and it's in the film. <laughs> What film is that? <laughs> it's called Warrior. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Next. Uh, thank you all for being here. My question is for Mr. Neely. Uh, do you vary your process of composing, whether it be for family drama such as Everwood or the DC TV universe? I wouldn't say I vary my process, but I have to um, sort of like act and get, get into the characters and get into the mood and the mode. And, um, with so many TV series, like my process now is like wake up in the Starbucks line, and think, what do I feel like writing today? Like, what am I? Am I feeling Arrow today or Supergirl? But sometimes the time just dictates and says, no, you're writing Legends today. That's <laughs> that's gonna happen. Um, but process-wise, it's pretty much the same, which is I watch watch the show and respond to what's going on. Um, so whether that's with tinkering on the piano or big brass or big percussion, it's sort of the same. It's just put, hopefully put the right music to the picture and bring the scene to life. I think the big question is, what are you doing that you're waking up in the Starbucks? And <laughs> I sleep at Starbucks. They have a policy now. You can, they won't make you leave. Uh, this question is 
for Mr. Bates. I was wondering, uh, because you had to score some of Guardians before it was filmed, how was your approach to it, um, this dilemma? Uh, again, I'd done a couple of films with James already, and we'd known each other for quite a while. So, um, you know, the songs were pretty much written into the script. And that was some great information for me as far as understanding, you know, how he wanted to land certain beats with with songs and what his sensibility was for that. So it did, in some way, impact the f finite style of how I was going to express this very melodic score. Um, but we were we were uh, really talking about the music in the most realistic, earnest uh, emotion, and so. You know, I really thought about that, and then just broad themes that could cut through the ocean of sound effects that you battle when you're in a film like that. The entire third act is is a, is every frequency that cancels out music. <laughs> <laughs> so, so some of the writing, you know, I kept it simpler uh, and really pushed the melody um, so that it wouldn't be a distraction. Um, and, uh, you know, you, it's a trial and error type scenario, you know, I learned from every, every cue, every movie, every TV show, and I'm still f trying to figure it out, so. But we do try and have a great collaboration with sound design, director, and music editors, editors, you know, do everything we can to bring everybody together and unify behind a singular vision, and that does impact uh, what the music becomes, ultimately. Next. Hi there, uh, my question is also for Mr. Neely. Uh, you are in charge of so much superhero music at this point. Five shows, I think. Thankfully, Kurt's got your back on Black Lightning. Good yeah. job. Uh, and now there's, there's <laughs> Titans coming up. They just announced a Batwoman. Like, how many superhero shows do you have in you, and uh, how do you manage it? Well, first of all, Blake's not doing Titans, I understand. I'm not doing Titans. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Uh, how many superhero shows do I have in me? Um, I. One of the reasons I'm not doing Titans is I didn't have that many in me, but now that I heard, now that I heard the announcement of Batwoman, it's like, maybe I have another one in me. That would be really fun. Um, so wait, what was the full question? Just uh, how do you manage that many shows every week? Well, the, the, the real way that I, that I tried to help myself was to make the shows sound different from each other but then make them where they could blend together. So it's sort of, they're in the same universe. But I had a, a thing years ago where I spent, I guess, I bet you guys have had this too, where I spent like all day writing this great cue on this great show and realized it was the, a show, a theme from another show. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I got to this, the, when Greg said we were doing more and more superhero shows, I decided I wanted to make them sound a bit different so that when I was writing in that, that sound world, it would make it easier to, you know, come up with Flash than spend all day writing Arrow on Flash. Um, but it, it's managed by their themes, you know, different themes used. Um, it's spread. I have a, a team of co-writers now that help me. Um, that are also credited on the shows if you watch. And I, I, I don't know. I sleep at Starbucks. That's how I make mean. it. <laughs> but it is, it is fun. Those shows are a lot of fun. As you, as you know. Yeah, it's a great deal of fun. <laughs> Next. Hi. Um, do you guys have a favorite instrument to write or feature, and why? <laughs> or not? <laughs> I just think certain projects will call out for a certain instrument that becomes the favorite for that project. You know, certain, I, I've written for Penny Whistle a couple of times because for some reason it was the exact instrument for that particular, which is an obscure little instrument that nobody would really want to play. And it's, I found somebody who played it completely beautifully, and it was, worked out well. And, uh, I like writing for trumpet, because I have put in many years as a trumpet player, but I, I don't insist upon putting trumpet in everything. Depends on, it depends on the project. For instance, the Punisher, He's a guitar player. Um, the showrunner requested that when I met with him, so I played <laughs> guitar and some other things for him. And uh, 
that's a, a, a very visceral experience, you know, working on this show because I play talk box and melodica and, you know, all kinds of guitars and stuff, so that's fun. Um, Superhero-esque stuff, I mean, it's weird to even think, like, of the genre. I just kind of do movies, but I find that I sing more of that stuff, at least to myself, and figure, find my way through uh, what I want to say that way. You know, piano, of course. I think we shy away from that question because it's um, it really depends on the project and the taste of, the, of your clients as a composer, um, and to to gravitate toward whatever your favorite instrument is as a composer multiple <coughs> times is probably not a good idea. You want to try to keep an open mind and and just allow yourself to uh, consider all the possibilities. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Hi, uh, I teach at a high school. What advice would you all have for young people who are really passionate about creating music but aren't really sure what to do about that passion? First of all, thank you for teaching. <laughs> I, I would say it's action. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to create a body of work no matter what, uh, whether you're commissioned to or not. And this should be, I think, something that's fluid in a person's life. It shouldn't only be assignment-oriented or commissioned. But I think there are so many uh, of, uh, vehicles available to us right now to serve as sources of inspiration if we're not simply just writing songs. You know, there's so much visual art that's available to us now to work with, poetry, books on tape, all kinds of things. So I really suggest that a young person, any person, explore uh, music that they personally relate to on an emotional level and uh, that are just really interested in and get really good at that. <laughs> I, uh, I believe the key is writing every day, because a lot of times, we, I remember, I wrote my first symphony when I was 12, and it wasn't that it was so great, it wasn't, the, <laughs> it wasn't Beethoven's fit, but you know something, from that moment on, I felt like I can write, you know, and every day I got to write, sounds were going on in my, heads all, in my head all the time, so the point was getting it out and trying it and twisting it around. And you know, it's the same thing that we're doing every day. Like uh, uh, this gentleman was saying, Tyler was saying that you, you're constantly learning. You know, you're constantly working at it. Well, start working now. You're not gonna stop. It doesn't, it doesn't end. There's not some point that you're gonna get to. I think everybody on the stage will tell you, no, they didn't get to this point where now it's all together. It's all all right. We have no stresses. We have nothing that we're afraid of. No, I wake up every day thinking, uh, uh, after 30 years of doing this, I keep on thinking, oh my God, they're gonna find me out this time. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you get in there and you keep doing the work. Do it because you love the work. Do it because you want to do this. Do it because you love the craft. It means something to you. It makes, it fills your heart, it fills your soul, and you want to get that out and push it out to others and fill their hearts and fill their souls. Super Blake, story of this musical genius that comes <laughs> 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 so <laughs> that story? Well, he's about to have a movie, but I wish that they would put Aquaman in the Arrowverse because it was my first comic book and I would love to write yeah. for Aquaman for whatever reason. It's always been one of my big favorites. Super Blake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not paying him, honestly. It's just... Bob, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the next... How many gift bags we have left? After this one, we have, there's like three more. So the next three people, since we didn't get to you, that, that you're welcome to get a gift bag. Uh, before we leave, we have like one minute. Uh, let's talk about upcoming projects you have, or what you're working on. Tyler, I'm going to start with you. Are you back on tour with Marilyn Manson? Or? No, I, uh, I ended my tenure. <laughs> I'm kidding, I was in 
like 40 countries last year alone, so I mean, I, I, I need to be in my studio. Uh, I'm excited to be working again on The Punisher. We're starting a new TV series of uh, The Purge, which is fun. And uh, several films coming up, you know, John Wick 3, there's another Guardians in the mix. Uh, uh, Hobbs and Shaw with the director from Deadpool 2 is coming up. And, um, a, lot of, a lot of cool things. I'm very, very thankful. I'm going to be doing The Neighborhood on a show on CBS and uh, another comedy uh, film called Tweed, which is going to be a Lionsgate film coming out. I just finished that. And coming back for Black Lightning 2. I've got, I think, rumor has it, the second season of Cloak and Dagger. Uh, uh, a new show, Less Than Zero, for Hulu. And then uh, a couple of films, one for Amblin, and then a new Gary Oldman film, starting with a couple of weeks. Uh, um, I have a Christmas movie coming out on Netflix this year, and that'll be followed by Frozen 2 and Ramona. Um, all the shows are coming back, so those are going to be fun. And there's a, a new show that Greg's doing called All American. It's a true story about a, a high school football player. Um, and we'll see what happens on the shows. Cool. Well, please help me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.